just looking around the room for, for Lawrence. Right, just being wired up, so... Uh, just making sure it's mic'd up. Hopefully you can hear me. It's, uh, can you hear me from this, uh, yes? Yep. Yeah, excellent. Hi, I'm Lawrence Parry. I'm Director, Head of Private Client Tax at, at Cordium. Uh, another tax partner at Cordium, Rob Edwards. Unfortunately, he's away at the moment. He's currently in Cambodia, which probably constitutes as being away. So, uh, so that's why you've got me here today. Uh, when I was asked to do this presentation three weeks ago, I thought, you know, 10 top tax tips for 2014. That sounds great. So first tip is you know, avoid alliteration, always. Never have a number of top tax tips, because either it's too many or it's not enough. And it's not enough because there are hundreds. Every client is different, every business is different. What you do here is not the same as what you do over there. And that adds to the interest for us, but it adds to the different things you can do in tax. It's too many because many of you will be structured as LLPs. You will have been talked to and had many papers on the proposed LLP changes. Well, last Friday, we had the final consultation response from HMRC on salaried partners. So I could have actually spent this half an hour, if I knew it was going to come out on Friday, just talking about this. It was planned to be last Monday. So we were assuming that you'd have had many responses in the last week. But it came out yesterday. So I will be touching on that a bit. So, tip one, can't talk to a group of regulated uh, businesses without mentioning the LLP changes. Key point, 6th of April 2014, you need to know whether your LLP members are so-called salaried members or not. That's six weeks away. If they're salaried members, you've got to consider the employment related securities issues, you've got to consider benefits in kind, you've got to consider pension contributions, you've got, they've got to consider their overlap issues because their, 12, 13, their 13, 14 tax bill is going to be different from what they're expecting. So you've got to, so as you can see I wrote these slides on last week, so you've got to check the tests, the capital contribution. Now. The revised guidance doesn't really help on capital contribution. I'm assuming that most of you will have some awareness of, of the issue, so I don't have to go through all of them in detail, because that would mean we'd be pushing not just back into sort of the, the drinks at 6 o'clock, but into breakfast as well. So capital contribution, you've got to have 25% of your fixed remuneration from your LLP is capital. How many businesses will do that? Very, very, very few. So in 10 top tax tips, let's move on. Profit sharing. How do people share profits? Are profits guaranteed for the LLP members? Or typically, are 80% of the profits that they're going to get guaranteed? And significant influence. As I said at the bottom, awaiting the update from HMRC, that came out on Friday. So, profit sharing arrangements. HMRC have a really, really narrow view of how profit should be shared between members of an LLP. They take the view, if you're a partner, you should get a percentage of the profits, because that's what it says in the books that were written 100 years ago. There is no business probably in this room or in this city, that divides profits like that. A fundament fundamental lack of commercial awareness permeates this whole consultation. So, has to be a percentage of profit, but why not stratify that profit? If you want to pay somebody £100,000, they get 20% on profits up to 500000 And they may get 5% on top of that. As long as HMRC accept that 5% and 
as a share overall is a percentage of the total profits, then they, this shouldn't give an issue. And actually, in the revised guidance, there's a very, very similar example. And as long as the percentage in B is less than 13.8%, the business saves money. Because the alternative is to treat this LLP member as an employee and pay Nash Insurance on it. Key point, this percentage must be reasonable. You can't, over, you can't give somebody 99% of the first uh, £100,000 profits and claim that's relating to profits. You can't give them too little of the percentage above the, uh, the layer because HMRC will say that's not a reasonable share of profits. But as long as that is mixed and it's mixed reasonably, this should work. <coughs> Tip two, or tip one, one B. How not to be a salaried member, how not to pay Dash Insurance on your LLP member's remuneration. If a member has significant influence over the running of the business, they won't be a salaried member. HMRC equates this to a board of directors, looking over the business as a whole, not just a unit. And prior to Friday, they would have said that a portfolio manager, even running an important part of the business, wouldn't have significant influence. They say running a branch doesn't give you significant influence. So, if you don't have a management, if you're a small partnership, six, eight, possibly even ten people at a push, if you don't have a management committee, then perhaps you could. You know, we're all for clients coming to us and paying for us to give them advice, but actually having a management committee that you document and minute every month with no involvement for us is an incre incredibly cost-effective way around this and very simple and easy for you to do. If the business is capable of disaggregation, so you are running separate branches, you're a corporate finance house, and you've got a place in Birmingham, you've got a place in London, Consider separate partnerships. So each unit has the, uh, each member has significant influence over its own unit. If there's any overall profit sharing, that might be subject to, uh, na to Nash Insurance and a salary member, but it should cut down the risk. Now, the one thing that did change on Friday that is really important for regulated fund management businesses is that HMRC have actually said, it's paragraph 2.5.3, it's already sort of uh, tattooed on my brain, saying this is something to trot out to HMRC at every opportunity, is that a portfolio manager will be considered to have significant influence. There's a specific paragraph on regulated businesses. Now, with the uh, changes to sort of, with the slides being prepared in advance, that's not on the slide. We will circulate that minute, circulate that note to everybody here later, and, so, and you can see that relevant paragraph. Now, one difficulty is that that's the revenue's guidance. Guidance can change. You may have a legitimate expectation as to how they'll interpret it, but they could, that's, not what the, that's not necessarily how the courts will sort of uh, interpret the law. So you do have to be slight watching brief, but that should work for most regulated businesses. Sorry, tip two, corporate partners. Those of you who have a corporate partner in your LLP structure, which is probably 95% of people with LLPs in the audience. You've got to decide what you're doing going forward because as of 6th of April, their benefit is significantly limited. This didn't change in Friday's uh, response and the consultation. So, are you going to be the LLP? Are you going to be a limited company? Those are your choices. If you're, why would you be an LLP? If you're going to take out all the profits anyway, 
and spend them, you might as well be. Because there's limited saving going through a limited company. But if you're retaining profits, and you want to grow the business from these retained profits and reinvest, then a limited company makes a lot of sense because you're only paying tax initially at 20%. Some influencing factors. If you've got new equity owners coming in, you might want to be an LLP because it's easier to bring people into an LLP than it is a limited company. There's potential changes to dual contracts on the horizon for non-DOMs and which will mean that the benefit of dual contracts, you've got a, a contract with your Cayman company for marketing services, contract in the UK with a limited company, will no longer be effective. You may still be able to do it if one's an LLP and Cayman is a limited company. If early years and you've got losses, you can get relief for them through an LLP, you can't through a limited. Again, influencing factors. If you want to be limited, then incorporation can give benefits. You can sell your business to a new co, not the existing corporate member, that will be caught by one of the anti-abuse rules, but a new co and potentially claim entrepreneur's relief. The amount payable for the business is left outstanding. As new co gets cash in, it repays that loan. You'll get, ta you'll get taxed on that goodwill at 10%, and as it comes through, that repayment of the loan is tax-free. The key point on this for regulated businesses is the red cap issue. You've got lots of goodwill, which you value at nil for red cap purposes. You've got lots of liabilities, which are in at a pound. How do you deal with that? We have seen this needs liaison closely with your auditors, because they need to be comfortable with the red cap position. We've seen ways of tying the liability to the asset together, almost stapling them together to allow that to happen. What if you've got a uh, corporate member? What can you do with that? Well, consider liquidating it. You've got cash in that corporate, that's sitting there. What do you do with that corporate going forward? If you were to liquidate it, you might be able to get that cash out with a tax charge of only 10%. key point is, is that company a trading company? Now, it has for many years been a corporate partner of a trading business, of a trading LLP. But it's sitting there with, in some cases, millions of pounds of cash. Is that cash on deposit a trading activity? Well, the first point, cash on deposit, and there's some really good not that many of you will be interested, but there's some really good tax case law on this. I read it. Suddenly, Chris Moyles is, is fun, suddenly interesting to read about. Uh, the cash on deposit is not an activity. So it can't not be not a trading activity because it's not an activity, it's passive. But if you've invested that money into your fund or somewhere else, there is a risk. Now, if, you, if that entrepreneur's relief is in doubt, that when you take that money out, you're going to pay tax at 28%, normal capital gains tax rates, not 10%, consider just investing through that corporate. Use that as a corporate investment vehicle and grow. Basically, leverage on the tax bill. If you're not sure there's going to be 10, leverage on the tax bill, liquidate it, pay 28% in five or 10 years' time. The growth, hopefully, will more than pay for the double tax charge at that time. We've had quotes from, cash, from insolvency practitioners. We're looking at five or six thousand pounds for cost for them, total cost for liquidating, seven to ten. Not that much to unlock the piggy bank of the corporate partner. Tip five, nine minutes to go. Non-DOMs and remittances. HMRC are becoming more and more aware of non-DOMs and how they use to keep their money offshore and the risks if they were to bring it back onshore. Key point is, if you're a non-DOM, you can keep all your investment gains abroad, only pay tax on what you bring back to the UK. 
Once you've been here seven years, you pay £30,000, almost a parking fee for that benefit. Once you've been here 12 years, it's £50,000. HMRC sent out letters to everybody they had on their uh, uh, database who claimed non-DOM status last year. They call them the nudge letters. Two pages of what they thought were areas where non-DOMs could be at risk of remittances. Now, some of those examples I disagree with. They're not set in stone, that's HMRC's opinion. But it is an indication of the sort of things they're looking at. Key ones, credit cards. Overseas credit card used in the UK. That's a remittance. Payment for services in the UK. If you've got overseas money, but you're using an onshore fund manager and you're paying them fees, that's a remittance. So if you've got non-DOM high net worth clients who are paying you a fee, that's a remittance by them. You do need to watch that. One example HMRC gave is overseas travel booked in the UK. They also give an example of overseas travel booked abroad. Don't see how that can be a remittance, but they give that as an example. Many non-DOMs have used back-to-back -back loan arrangements to bring money into the UK. They've got assets abroad, they borrow from a foreign bank, they bring the foreign loan into the UK. They haven't remitted the overseas money, they've remitted the loan. And there's HMRC guidance that says that's okay as long as the loan is on arm's length terms. Private Eye article in October last year set how, out how this, happened, how this happens in five or six paragraphs. HMRC are aware of this article because the specialist spoke to me about it afterwards. So this may be a risk going forward. Do be aware of that. Non-DOM's inheritance tax. If you're a non-DOM, you only pay inheritance tax on your UK assets, not your overseas assets. That changes when you've been here for 17 out of the last 20 years. Unless your domicile is that of India, Pakistan, and France. So, key point. So, once you've been here 17 years, you're then subject to inheritance tax on your worldwide assets. So the tip is, you're getting to years 15 and 16 of residence, consider moving your offshore assets into an offshore trust prior to the 17 years. Either that or acquire a domicile of India, Pakistan and France. Overseas workday relief. Really small point in this, but we're seeing increasing, inqu there's always been inquiries on overseas workday relief. Non-DOM comes to the UK, first three years, overseas work days. If the money's paid abroad and kept abroad, there's no tax charge in the UK on it. And it's done a, on a time apportioned basis. So if you're working abroad a third of the time, you can keep a third of your money offshore with no UK tax charge. HMRC have always inquired into the work days on a forensic basis. Where did you spend that half a day? Where did you spend that day? And they had, they've always done that. Increasingly, we're looking at the third year of inquiries. More and more and more of our clients who are in this third year of residence, the rules changed last year with statutory residence test, but in the third year of residence, HMRC is saying, are you really still not ordinary resident? So if you are in that position for 12.13 and you've just submitted your tax return, do get your documents in order, because HMRC will come knocking. Tip eight, watch losses. Now losses are restricted. In the old days, you used to be able to offset losses sideways, you used to be carry back losses in early years, uh, you used to get losses for interest relief, you get losses for shares, sort of uh, for loss relief for shares in an unquoted trading company. All of those could be used very, very flexibly. Now, that's restricted. To, 50, to the higher of 50,000 pounds, or 25% of your total income in the year. 
Now, if you've got losses, typically, you're unlikely to have lots of total income in your year. So for, these, for you who may be affected, that may be £50,000. You need to watch that and plan, if you're thinking to make losses, plan in advance to, find, to see if there is anything you can do. When they should the fall, what accounting period should we look at? What other income can we generate? Tip nine, gift aid. Some of our clients give a lot of money to uh, charity. Many of our clients are too busy to write it down. Even with the best PA in the world, they still don't record it as quite as uh, helpfully as they could. If it's any consolation, even uh, on all joint gifts that me and my wife make, I ring her up and tell her we made a joint gift so she can write it down, because she's organised and I may be less so. So, it's not the fact you don't get tax relief, it's one of the few things that you are no longer capped with tax relief. So, if you are going to make charitable donations, and the donation is going to be big enough, consider setting up your own charitable trust. It's not that costly. All your contributions into the charitable trust will qualify for gift aid. You don't need to keep records because it goes in as one transfer. And that's it done. As long as a charity carries on charitable activity, that's great. <coughs> if the donations are smaller, consider using something like the Charities Aid Foundation. Yes, there's a cost of 4%, but again, all your contributions go in and you get tax relief. You can carry back that tax relief to the prior year. All your record keeping is done for you. You need to watch restrictions, particularly with a charitable trust, and you need to have sufficient income. We have some clients who have given so much money away, they actually have to pay the tax relief that the charity is claiming back to HMRC. So, 449, and the last tip is. We are here to help. Do give us a call. Contact details are in the presentation. Let me have a quick look at any questions. Got one question, and we've got time for one question. Regarding the cap on losses, does it apply to income tax, partnership profits, or capital gains losses? It, reply, it applies to the 50,000 cap applies to your losses. So you look at your losses, how much you've got. Income losses. Those losses can be offset against other income or gains capped at that £50,000. So your total, the 25% the of the 200000 includes income, doesn't include capital gains, but it does on the carry back. And I'll, there's, a, there's a paragraph I know I can research and I can, I'll circulate that round afterwards for everybody as well. 450? 10 top tax tips. <laughs>